In this episode, we will discover the ancestor of a pyramid, a tomb for very rich people called Mastaba. And the deceit is not buried where you think. Mastaba is an Arabic word that refers to the bench often placed against the wall of a house. The Egyptian workers of my favorite Egyptologist, Auguste Mariette, who I spoke about in a previous episode, were the ones who gave his name to the brick or stone tombs, shaped more or less like a trapezoid, that they found during their excavations. Ancient Egyptians called this tomb Ia. This tomb, built above a level of desert, recalls very ancient Egyptian belief about the first eel to appear on Earth. According to the ancients, when this eel emerged from the water, it allowed animal species to develop by sheltering first snakes and then frogs. And as you can see, the mastaba is a reminder of this eel not only in its shape but also in its name, since the original eel is called Iyat in Egyptian. The earliest mastabas had a trapezoidal shape that resembled the original eel, but as time went on, the kings changed the shape of their tombs, and the tombs of the nobles who lived at the time of the first pyramids in the Old Kingdom came to be called mastaba. The first mastabas date back to a very ancient period, around 2900 to 2600 before Christ. At the time, some kings ruled from Abydos, and it's therefore around the city that we find the first royal mastabas. Later on, the cemetery of Saqqara, which is located right next to the city of Memphis, was chosen to become a royal necropolis, so mastabas of kings can be found in the south as well as in the north. When the pharaohs discovered the model of a pyramid later, they abandoned the mastabas, and the nobles, who were always trying to imitate the kings, started being buried in mastabas. At the site of Giza, famous for its three grandiose pyramids, there are so many mastabas of nobles that visitors get the impression of being in a city of the dead when they walk around the site to visit some of them. A mastaba is a house tomb, and really, I'm not joking when I say that. The mastaba of King Shesterskaf was originally more than 100 meters long and nearly 75 meters wide. And the whole structure was more than 20 meters high. So, in this case, his mastaba was even a tomb palace. The mastaba is really the house of a dead person, so at least there will be a room where the family and friends of a deceased can come to say prayers and bring gifts. One room is the minimum, and the record number of rooms in a royal mastaba is 57, held by the king Haseremui, and 33 rooms for the vizier Meruruka. Well, in his case, he had built a huge tomb house with a sector for himself, another for his wife, the princess Watetreter, and their eldest son, Mary Tetti. Well, now I think you really understand what a tomb house means. In fact, they are inaccessible rooms because they are walled up at the time of a person's burial. Inside them were statues of a dead person or gifts for him or her, as well as offerings of food and drinks. Ancient Egyptians believed that after the death, they could live a new life in the kingdom of the dead and would want and need to eat and drink again. There are also open rooms that allowed anyone to enter the mastaba. Usually, it was the family and friends of a deceased who entered the tomb to pray for him or her or to bring food and drink. So while there may be many rooms in a mastaba, the dead person will never be found in any of them. The deceit is never buried in but under mastaba. With this map, you will understand very easily. At ground level, there is the tomb with one or more rooms. At the beginning, the dead person was simply buried in the ground of one of these rooms. And later, workers would dig tunnels called funerary shaft because they plunge vertically into the ground. But obviously, there is never water at the bottom. This funerary shaft 
can measure several meters or go up to 50 meters under the mastaba. At the bottom of this shaft, you will find what is called the burial chamber, meaning the room where the dead person sleeps for eternity. In this room, the mummified body of the owner of the mastaba is usually placed in a stone sarcophagus or in a wooden coffin. The gifts that the family and friends of the deceased brought during the funeral are placed next to it. Then the burial chamber is closed with a brick wall and once everyone has returned to the surface, the funeral shaft is completely filled with earth, sand, stones and pieces of wood. At ground level, which is also covered in earth, the entrance to the funeral shaft should no longer be visible. The purpose of a mastaba is to hide the entrance to a tunnel that leads to the mummy, and the bigger the mastaba is, the more difficult it will be for thieves. The pharaoh Nichiri Red, better known under the name of Djoser, put in Motep, a man of many talents in charge of building his mastaba. The architect began by creating a huge stone mastaba, but his master was not satisfied and wanted an even bigger tomb. And what did Imhotep do? He decided to enlarge the mastaba by peeling several mastabas one on top of another. Well, you won't believe it, but it still wasn't big enough for Djoser, because his architect had to modify the construction of his tomb a third time by widening it and make it even higher. And that's how the first pyramid was born from a mastaba. However, contrary to what almost everyone thinks, Imhotep did not invent on his own this pyramid shape. On the same site of Saqqara indeed, archaeologists have found a grave halfway between a mastaba and a pyramid that looks like an unfinished pyramid. It was built for Nebetka, who played the role of Prime Minister for King Dan. Even if Imhotep was brilliant, he still relied on the model of the architect who built his tomb before him.